Paul Simon returned it later. He actually didn't return because as Costas tells us at the end of the episode, Simon sat there and talked for three episodes worth of conversation. The first two uh, had aired in late February of 91. This one was March 28th of 91. So it's the third and final segment of a long conversation between Paul Simon and Bob Costas. In this one, he talks at length about being compared to Dylan and his attitude toward Bob and uh, came close, came close to hanging him out to dry. You could tell that he, he measured his words several times. Simon also talks about the film One Trick Pony and a song in particular from that Think Too Much. Speaks at length about the songwriting process and the responsibility of being a songwriter and where rock and roll will end up being measured on a historical basis. So, pretty good interview. Costas always does a good job. Hi, and thanks for staying up later. Perhaps you were with us a couple of weeks ago when we ran back-to-back -back shows on a Wednesday and Thursday with Paul Simon. Normally, that just about takes care of it, but in Paul's case, it turned out we were just warming up. So we let the cameras keep on rolling, and we recorded a third show. Here it is. Each song is, is a slice of, of feeling and the way you think at a particular time, and it may not be the way you think five years later, but you've written lines like, the more I get to thinking, the less I tend to laugh. Does that still hold up? That still tend to be true? I guess it really depends on context. I mean, you know, I, I wrote a song called uh, Think Too Much. Because mm -hmm. people were always saying, oh, well, you think too much. So I wrote this sort of uh, comical song called Think Too Much. I was on the Hearts and Bones album. And then I thought, well, you know, you're writing a really a comical song about about think too much when actually maybe you do think maybe you maybe you shouldn't be that could be some kind of defense that you're writing this kind of jokey song about think too much maybe it's really true and then I said well this is exactly their point now I now I'm <laughs> you know I'm thinking about do I think too much so I said well I'll write another song called think too much I'll write two songs called think too much which is exactly what someone who thinks too much should do <laughs> you know <laughs> Um, and while I think that that was like a kind of a logical way of expressing the idea of someone who thinks too much, I also think it's funny, you know? Um, the, the line, the line I, I quoted about the more I get to think and the less I think. from Old Marion? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, that's from One Trick Pony, which I, I've yeah. always thought is at least one side of it is some of your best work. It's among my favorite Paul Simon oh, uh, albums, but I think it got drowned beneath the movie, which didn't do so well. Well, the movie, uh, the movie didn't do well at all. But the movie was barely released. Part of the problem with the uh, album was that they, uh, they released the movie in about seven cities. So I had a, an album that was a, a soundtrack album to a movie that you couldn't see. I mean, uh, uh, I don't think it was a particularly great movie, but I don't think it was a terrible movie either. You know what I mean? And some reviews uh, actually liked it. I mean, there were some critics that actually put it in their top 10 films of the year. And some people said, this is just a ridiculous. What is he doing? The guy doesn't know how to write, doesn't know how to write movies or make movies. I, uh, I saw it at least twice when it first came out, which was what, 80 or 81, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that, I think, I'm aware of what you were driving at in the movie, but I thought that it just was more heavy-handed than your music, that, that your persona was a little arch on mm -hmm. screen, and the, point, the points were not as subtly made as points are made in your best music. Yeah, I'm sure that that's so. I mean, uh, it, was the, it was my first uh, and only uh, attempt at writing a screenplay. Well, I was having such a good time writing a screenplay. I was so interested in like, how you write a screenplay it took me a couple of years to write. Um, that for me, I f felt a sense of pride that I actually wrote a screenplay that was made into a movie and it became, uh, you know, a flawed movie. You know, okay, you know, or maybe even not a good movie. Uh, there were some scenes in the movie that I thought were good and mm -hmm. anyway, the, the idea that I did a piece of work that wasn't really uh, 
great. Uh, I didn't feel embarrassed by that. I, it was my first screenplay. You know, uh, and it's probably be my, la my last uh, screenplay. Ink. There was a whole bunch of guys that I knew, both here and uh, in England, who played their instruments well and wrote songs well, and then the style changed. And they were out. And it wasn't just that they were out, also the, the places that they could work and earn their living, they kept shrinking. The, the, the club circuit kept shrinking. And these guys not only did not have the skills to do something else, they didn't want to do anything else. They were good at what they did, and they liked being musicians, and uh, they were being trapped by the fact that style changed. So that's what I was, that's what I was writing about, uh, that, that kind of uh, person. And um, I found that, uh, you know, very, you know, very interesting life dilemma. A lot of people said, uh, what, why was I doing that when I wasn't that person? Why is Paul Simon so obsessed with failure when the guy's obviously a success, you know? I wasn't r writing about me. I was writing about this other character. You know? And I didn't, it seem, didn't seem to me like you were writing about someone who was an abject failure either because there was admiration in it. There was you standing outside and admiring the, the integrity of, of there being, the integrity right. of their performance. Well, that's hey, how I feel. He gives his testimony and he that's relaxes how, in the weeds. Right. Well, that's how I feel. About, I mean, it's, it's, it tends to be my feeling, of, my feeling about musicians. I have a lot of respect for musicians, for, for, for their, the amount of knowledge that they need just to be, you know, an average professional musician is extraordinary. I mean, I think uh, musicians are not sufficiently respected. Again, on that same album, there's a, there's a line where you, you talk about uh, it's in the same song we mentioned before. Boy's got a brain, he just abstains. He's got a heart, beats on the opposite side. Strange uh -huh. phenomenon, laws of right. nature defied. Well, you what? really, you have those in your notes? No, no, I, I, I remember those, uh -huh. I remember those songs. Well, I'm and flattered, another, Thank an, you. another line from that same song that I, that I thought was, it, it, it touched me, was, ah, but when I sing, I can hear the truth auditioning. Is there always that tension between the part of you that says, look, I got, I got to shift my heart for its safety's sake. I can't be out here like some sentimentalist slobbering all over myself. On the other hand, when I sing, there's, there's the truth. How, how can I find a meeting place be, where, where I'm safe personally, but where I can also get the truth out there? Well, I think it's my job uh, not, to, not to actually be that concerned about being safe. I think you go for you go you go for whatever it is that you think the truth is. In my case, I find the the area that I feel most vulnerable in and therefore the area that I'm most interested in is the heart, love. That's the area that I least want to talk to you about or tell you about or reveal about myself. And so that's the area that I feel compelled to write about. Uh, and if I miss when I'm writing about that area, if I miss on one side, I miss and it's sentimental, which is embarrassing. If you miss and, it's, and you're sentimental, it's embarrassing. And if you miss on the other side, then it's pretentious. And that's even more embarrassing. But I really feel it's like the job to go for the hit. And if you miss and they they laugh at you or they criticize you, well, you know, get a tougher skin because uh, the job is to try and tell the truth about what your heart is and, uh, and it's, a, it's a somewhat of a dangerous job because if you, if you make a mistake, you're going to feel like a fool. Uh, but that's what I think the job is if you're a writer. And about the, the famous songs of Simon and Garfunkel, how much of your indifference to some of them like I read in a Playboy interview some years ago where you said Bridge Over Troubled Water doesn't mean anything to you anymore, at least at the time you said it, it didn't. How much... Well, I don't, I don't know if I said that. I, I don't think I would have meant that, but what I felt was it, it didn't... It had become so institutionalized that it hardly felt like it was my creation. It seemed like a bigger, you know, you know... Mm -hmm. It was more like, uh, I mean, it had become a gospel 
standard. I mean, it was in churches. It seems so beyond. I, it was hard to remember that I sat in my, you know, apartment and wrote it on a guitar. And it was on Muzak too. And of course, it was in it elevators. Was, and of course, it was in elevator. Well, a lot, of, a lot of those songs from Simon and Garfunkel were, were in elevators. But Bridge Over Troubled Water. First, the fact that Artie, it was Artie's solo, and uh, and also that it became so huge. You know, it just it just seemed like it wasn't. It seemed like mine. Do you ever have a moment? where you say, I got a song, or a fragment of a song, that's a Simon and Garfunkel song. And if only for that moment, you wish you could bring that back together. Um, yes, uh, although the way I think of it is, that's a Simon and Garfunkel type melody. Like there's a song on uh, this uh, new album, that's called The Cool, Cool River. And there's a section of that song that to me sounds just like Simon and Garfunkel type songs. I mean, it happens to be in a strange time signature. It's in 9-8, which is, you know, Simon and Garfunkel never would have been in, but uh, very much like that in, in, in style. But uh, that, was, uh, that, was part of my, uh, that was part of my writing process and part of my learning. I mean, I started off listening to, I mean, totally rejected the music of my father's generation. It wasn't even a rejection. I just simply wasn't interested. You know. And I became interested in music with uh, early rock and roll, and the first music that I liked was doo-wop. Uh, and sang in groups, you know, doo-wop groups, with Artie, in fact. And so uh, that was the first style that I started to write in. And then, uh, and then when the folk movement started, I mean, I was, was listening to uh, the Weavers and, uh, and Pete Seeger and the Kingston Trio, and then Bob Dylan, and, uh, and then that whole scene of, uh, you know, Phil Oakes and Tom Paxton and Dave Van Runk and all of that. And then I moved to England, and I became further involved in uh, the English, uh, you know, the English style of folk and blues. And, uh, and all of that became music that I, you know, at one time wrote in. And I feel now that when I write, uh, I'm drawing upon all these different periods and my knowledge of music, even my knowledge of music that, you know, was pre-rock and roll. How much of your best lyrics do you think would stand alone as poetry, or can it never be regarded that way, that, that the music is, is lifted by, by the lyric and the lyric lifted by the music and they're, and they're inseparable? That is what is unique about S songwriting. I mean, I think you can take individual lines of my lyrics and uh, they're very interesting and they may be in it, have a very interesting image. Um, but if they're not attached to the right melody, what's the difference, really? It's the combination that makes a song and that makes for a, a powerful, a powerful song. I mean, uh, There'll be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover is, uh, you know, greeting card type stuff. But in the context of the melody and in World War II, uh, it was extraordinarily powerful and able to move uh, a nation. And that's what it was. It was a song. I mean, you weren't supposed to separate. You weren't supposed to separate them. So uh, that's what a song is. The melody uh, is, uh, can't be described as well as uh, lyrics can be. And it touches some part of you that, uh, you know, is, is nonverbal. And that's what's great about it. And if you combine it with the right sounds and the right image, then it's extraordinary. And if you have an extraordinary image with the wrong melodic thing, well, it's, you might as well write it as a piece of poetry. It's not a song. I guess it's hard to explain, except everybody who likes popular music knows what it is intuitively. When Smokey Robinson says, and I'm not going to try to sing it, when he says, ooh, baby, baby, that's eloquent. Yeah, because that's music. It's, no, it's nonverbal. And the voice, the human voice, can, uh, you know, convey all kinds of meanings that uh, you, don't, uh, you wouldn't get just from the words. I mean, uh, Bob Dylan, who was, uh, you know, not considered to be like a technically great singer, 
has, I think, in, 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 his, in the quality of his voice, the ability to convey more than one meaning at once with the same line, which is extraordinary. Same with uh, John Lennon. Um, so, I mean, there's something wonderful about certain voices, uh, and, they, and they can convey powerful emotions and meanings just with their sound, and there's no way of uh, describing why or even imitating it. You just said something very nice uh, about Bob Dylan. Some years ago in the Playboy interview you did, you said it was difficult to compliment Dylan, even though he richly deserves it in some cases, because he himself is ungenerous toward other musicians. You still feel that way? Well, I should put it this way. I, I don't... No, I don't think that that's so. But I don't hear him say... Well, I don't hear him say much. Anyway, you know, I don't hear him say much. I've heard him, you know, I mean, he's, he's credited uh, Woody Guthrie and, and people, but I don't hear him say, uh, say, say much about about other musicians. I could be wrong, though. I'm not, like, really following what he's saying all the time, and maybe I shouldn't have, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Uh, in the beginning part of my career, I and so many other writers of my generation were constantly compared to and measured against uh, Dylan and uh, Lennon, McCartney, and... In, but in my case, particularly Dylan, because, uh, because we were both people whose words were being examined, that um, I just felt like always uncomfortable about it. I don't feel that way anymore. I haven't felt that way for, for a long time. But in the beginning, I felt I was always being compared, usually unfavorably, uh, to Bob. And in fact, uh, he was really uh, the great lyricist of the 60s you know, and deserved all, deserved all his praise. And um, So I, maybe I was reacting, or just reacting to that. It was like kind of an irritant that wasn't his fault. It wasn't like that he ever did anything. And in fact, personally, he's been actually very nice to me you know, and nice about my work. How kindly do you think history will view rock and roll? Is it an essentially limited form so that the very best, so that John Lennon or Dylan at his best or Paul Simon stand as the valedictorians of that class, but it's a different class than Duke Ellington or George Gershwin or Cole Porter? It really takes like a hundred years before you get to, know, get to decide whether uh, Gershwin was a giant of popular music, and uh, Lennon or Dylan were not in the same league, or vice versa. Certainly, on a on a on a musical level, uh, Gershwin was a more sophisticated musician and composer. Uh, but. Uh, uh, Dylan's understanding of uh, his time and uh, the Lennon-McCartney understanding of their time was uh, was extraordinary. And we were th at that point in an age where uh, people understood the media and the immediacy of work. Um, so uh, it, it, the context, you would have to understand the, the context of an age to understand just how well somebody somebody was doing. Simon got what in hockey they call the pure hat trick. He didn't make three appearances at different times. I mean, these were three all in one sitting in the same clothes. We better both go take a shower. See you later.